Um, so I thought I'd first talk about the genesis of this series, which I call Misbegotten Sea Creatures. And it's actually rather fitting that this work is in this show twofold, all about long-term artist couples, because two of the events that catalyzed this series were um, a funny little greeting card. I found it, it's like a thank you note, and I found it at an independent bookstore in my neighborhood. And the front of it says, thank you for, and then it has all these check boxes, misbegotten sea creature, canopic jars, you know, all sorts of goofy things. And I just stuck it in a drawer. And then um, after the first night that like he made me dinner and took me hiking in the Wissahickon, I thought, wouldn't I be like really cute and clever if I mailed him a card from five blocks away? So I, I mailed him the thank you card <laughs> for you know, dinner and the hike and the misbegotten sea creature. Um, and I owe a debt of gratitude to this card designer because that phrase, misbegotten sea creature, really stuck with me. Um, and then another thing that catalyzed it was this funny root ball that you can see up there. Uh, it was in my neighbor's yard and it was like a bit up a hill and I look at it and I'm like, that thing's weird. I wonder what that thing is. Um, and then, you know, it'd like rain or we'd have a thunderstorm, it would come partly down the hill and then I'd get a bit of a closer look at it, but I didn't want to be one of those neighbors that's like in other people's yards with a little shovel, like monkeying around with their landscaping. Until one day I was on a walk with him and it had finally rolled to the sidewalk. Like the sidewalk's fair game, right? That's that's public property. And, and I picked it up and I said, yeah, that's a keeper. And I said, this is my misbegotten sea creature. I'm going to draw it. I'm going to make a whole phylum of misbegotten sea creatures. And that was just, you know, like you say things or you think things in the shower, maybe something comes of it, maybe something doesn't. And it sat, you know, on the back burner of my brain for a couple of years at a low simmer. But around this time, I was also kind of obsessively and repetitively consuming the BBC Earth Blue Planet series. Have you guys watched any of the BBC Earth stuff? Yeah, so like Blue Planet, this poor guy, you know, anytime I was spending the night, he'd be I'm like, you, <laughs> he was like totally down. I know, but like, you know, at the like 87th time when he'd be like, do you want to watch something? I'm like, Blue Planet. <laughs> He's like, yeah. not Blue Planet again. And for me, every time was like the first time, like, here's the hairy anglerfish. Yay. So I'm, I'm watching that on repeat for like 18 months at a time. And then another just influence, and this is something that he and I have in common, is I tend to scavenge. So, you know, I'll go on a walk or I'll be on a family trip at the beach and I just find all kinds of fascinating little things that I like to pick up and take home. So whether it's a really cool piece of lichen or a piece of moss or a seed pod or this seaweed in the picture, um, that fish carcass, if I could have found a way to bring that home without polluting my neighborhood <laughs> with the stench, I, it would totally be living on my radiator shelf <laughs> with that lichen. Um, so my, my studio and my house, they both have like these little collections of just doodads that I've picked up. Um, but at the time, I wasn't, you know, like I kept saying, I'm going to invent my own phylum of misbegotten sea creatures. I'm going to draw a million of them. But I was working on other stuff and it was rooted in biology, but it was primarily using medical imaging and histopathology. And so I hadn't really touched on the misbegotten sea creatures until for whatever reason, I just decided to start doing that. And so this was the first one I drew, um, pretty much inspired by that funny root ball. I still don't know like what that root ball was when it was a living growing thing. Uh, but I started drawing this and thinking like these funny little suck holes, I was thinking of them as digestive vacuoles. And I was like, so when this creature has more exposure to sunlight, these digestive vacuoles expand so that they can better take in phytoplankton. And I was thinking, okay, that's what misbegotten sea creatures sustain themselves with. And also early in the series, I did this. Um, that eye that just kind of appears in the middle, like in the words of Bob Ross, that was really just a happy little accident. And when it worked out that way, I was like, fabulous. I just want to have this big mall that's like, rawr, and it 
you know, because misbegotten sea creature, like to me, there was always a humorous element to that, that I took it from this Greek, this greeting card that was really quirky and goofy. And I think the illustration on the greeting card is goofy. If any of you ever find out who that artist and designer was, please send them my way. I should at least give them like a cut of all misbegotten <laughs> sea creature <laughs> sales. And all the materials I was using for these sea creatures, they were really simple. So I would just roll a section of watercolor paper out. Um, I was using graphite powder, uh, a lot of pencils that I wore down to tiny, tiny, tiny little nubbins. I had a collection that I kept for a while. And then uh, graphite putty, which is this stuff made by Art Graph. It's a company in Portugal. And I saw a YouTube advertisement for it of all things. And I like to think I'm like more evolved than to fall prey for like YouTube and Instagram advertisements. But I saw someone like just playing with putty and I was like, oh yeah, click order. <laughs> and so that's how I was doing things like getting those big washes was with graphite putty and adding a bit of water. And that's what made it darker. And so as I was making all these Creatures, you know, I considered a phylum to be a classification based on a body plan. And the body plan to me, and I, biologists and botanists can probably debate this a lot more intelligently than I ever could, but that was like my working definition. And I was looking at them like, okay, they're invertebrates and they have these digestive vacuoles. But then I started to like ask myself a series of questions like, how do they get around in the water? Are they kind of Cecil and they go where the tide takes them, you know, or do they have their own motility? Um, you know, I figured out I, I was pretty sure they eat phytoplankton, but then I was like, I wonder if any of them are like deep sea creatures, so maybe they don't have access to phytoplankton and what would they eat? How do they reproduce? Is it sexual? Is it asexual? Um, and how is I going to distinguish like one class of misbegotten sea creatures from another? And then once I had some classes mapped out, how was I going to figure out like orders, families, genus, genuses, I don't know how to say that word in plural, um, species, you know, and like how many exist. And so it, what I would do is I, I have all these little notebooks and post-it notes and I made notes on my studio wall and I was trying to sort of figure all this out. And then I was like, maybe some of them are even vertebrate critters but they still have the digestive vacuoles and then I realized like one person like can't really invent a phylum on their own and figure all this stuff out and so I started looking to existing stuff to help me figure out how to invent a phylum. Uh, so I looked pretty closely at cnidaria which jellyfish are a part of and I also looked at coral. I was especially interested in coral or basically in like clonal colonies and a lot of them reproduce by budding. And I was looking at that and comparing it to cell division and that got my heart pumping. So I was thinking about that a lot. And then during Philadelphia open studio tours, um, this medical doctor came in and we we're like talking about inventing creatures and stuff. And he said, you should read this book that I read in undergrad when I couldn't decide between going to vet school and going to med school in vertebrate zoology. I loved it. And we looked it up on Instagram together and he um, picked out his favorite edition of the book for me to order. So that was like, that was great. I learned so much about the Nidaria phylum. And so I used that to kind of inform this invention of a lot of imaginary creatures. And I thought, as I figure this out, like what I'm going to have to do is like start at the most granular level and make a bunch of species and then you know I'll organize all my species into you know a genus I'll have like five here and I'll make another five and put them in this genus over here so it's like rummaging through my art supplies and I found I don't even remember when I bought this pad of vellum but I found it and like it was the right size and I didn't have to try and cut a bunch of smaller pieces off this massive roll of watercolor paper. And it has this really nice milky translucency. And then I put some graphite and water on the surface and I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> like I'm going to make so many species. And I went back to someone that I often 
go back to to look at um, when I need inspiration or when I just want to ogle like really amazing drawings, which is Ernst Haeckel. And he was a zoologist, illustrator, essayist. Um, he was a lot of different things working in the second half of the 1800s. And he discovered and documented a lot of radiolaria. And I think to this day, if you Google radiolaria or radiolarian, Hegel always pops up. Um, and I just, I love old encyclopedias and things that were documented before. I mean, photography existed in Hegel's lifetime, but it was not this inexpensive, scalable technology where, you know, now we just, we take a picture of anything that we want to remember. Um, for him to try and analyze the structure of these radiolaria, which were single-celled protozoa with these amazing little skeletons, you know, he had to draw them. And so he had, you know, these documented radiolaria. And I was like, well, that's basically what I want to do with all these little species that I'm going to invent and figure out how to classify into this taxonomy of my own making. And so I had all these little doodads. Um, I think you can definitely see the jellyfish influence on the one, um, that last one on the right. I was, because I'd been comparing coral to cell division and coral reproduction, um, I looked at the telophase of cell division and I thought this one, its motility probably came from like using an accordion motion to get through the water. Um, this guy second to the right, I thought he probably just floats around, but he's really, really good at eating a lot of phytoplankton. <laughs> and I don't know if I had the idea that I wanted to go bigger with these species. Like, you know, I, I figured these eight by eight things I was doing, some of them were 11 by 11. I looked at them as like life size, you know, like, if they existed in the ocean, if you went to the beach and it was floating there next to a jellyfish, it would be about this big. But I wanted to work bigger. Like I love churning out lots of little drawings, but I really, really love four foot by four foot is like my happy place um, in making art. And I don't know if I went looking for this or just discovered it at the art supply store, but I found rolls of drafting vellum and it was that same like milky translucency and such a nice texture. And then I was like, now we're gonna have to make shoals. <laughs> that was, it was a lot of shoals and I loved this surface because I could layer it. So, you know, I'd smear a lot of graphite on it and add a lot of water and go in and draw it. And then I would like wipe a lot of it away just with a sponge or a wet paper towel, but it was like the ghost of that image would remain. And so that, you know, that pentimenti became, you know, like one layer and then I'd go in again on top and then on top again. And I just loved that it looked wet because of the wet graphite. Like it would, because vellum doesn't absorb the way paper does. Like the paper just sucks up the water with the graphite, kind of like paper will suck up paint. And this, it would just, sit and puddle until it totally dried. I'd put a fan on it and just walk away from it for a few hours or a day to see what happened. And I really loved that wet look. I loved that I could still treat it like paper though and erase into it. And then, and then I was really curious about shoals in general. Like they have this collective intelligence that, you know, the sum is greater than the parts. And then I went back to Blue Planet and started looking at shoals of fish and like how they'll swim in a certain formation to make them less vulnerable to predators and stuff. And I read up on aspen trees because they live in clonal colonies and they share this whole rhizome network. And so I was thinking of shoals as, you know, it, it's like all these little individual creatures and it might be hard to differentiate, like, you know, is this a hundred or is it a thousand misbegotten sea creatures? But it really functions as like one highly intelligent unit. So, Shoals kept me going for a while and they were time consuming. So they kept me busy, they kept me happy. Um, the whole series was like really pretty happy for me. And I found humor in, you know, creating malls and thinking about imaginary creatures that would just sweep through the ocean, like sucking up all the phytoplankton. Um, so I was, I was making all these shoals and I didn't want to display them in a traditional way in a frame 
because I really, really liked that vellum and how it was translucent. So I started playing with different options. Like, am I going to build a light box? Or if I do put it in a frame, can I put some distance between the backing board and the drawing and like put spacers in it so that you'll still get that translucency effect. And then I ended up on plexiglass. I went to everything plastic in Northern Liberties and I bought just a couple of pieces and built myself like a tiny mock-up. And it, it kind of looked like crap because I didn't know what I was doing with plexiglass, but it was enough to like give me the right idea. And Mount Airy Contemporary, which is a small artist-run gallery in our neighborhood, um, they had me, Greg, and this wonderful artist, Brooke Hine, who does these brilliant ceramics that also look very sea creaturous sea creature like and some of them have cat whiskers in them um so we had this three-person show together that was wonderful and mount airy contemporary said yes we'd love for you to try you know your new display option so i got to try that there and then i had these giant plexiglass slides then from that show and when the show came down i took them back to my studio and my studio has these like wonderful 20-foot ceilings and so I suspended them from the ceiling and saw them in front of the sunlight. And then I was like, hooray, like <laughs> I think my sea creature self-actualized. And um, Claire was really supportive when she reached out to us about this show. And I said, well, this is the work, you know, I'm like putting together with Greg for twofold. Are you open to this plexi thing? And like, could they hang in front of windows? And she said, yes. And I was really happy because um, after Mount Airy Contemporary, I was thinking it would be so wonderful to fill like a large room with this stuff. Dick, that's my former <laughs> boss. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I thought, wouldn't it be cool to just like fill this room and create like a real aquarium experience? Have, have any of you ever been to like Baltimore Aquarium and you see the shark tank? Yeah, and you get out like the big spiral and there's just like all those critters like all up in your face and just you know this much distance between you and them i really wanted to create that environment um but i had a lot of personal life issues going on i lost my mother and then we had a pandemic and so i didn't get to build my plexiglass wonder world yet and then and then i'd already like moved into a different series but claire and in liquid said yes you can hang plexiglass here we will make it work thank you for that uh, and so that's, I hope to one day continue with the Plexi. Um, I don't think I'll work a lot more into the series, but I do want to put together like this coffee table book, similar to the invertebrate zoology book. I want to write like this scientific monograph that sounds real, but is fake. And I want it to have a dust jacket and just sit on <laughs> coffee tables and, you know, for people to read or not as they see fit. Um, so that's all I prepared for you guys, and I want to say thank you for coming and listening to my chatter about stuff that I make up in my head. And that is all of my digital contact methods, so feel free to get in touch, stalk me on the internet. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll turn it over to my Harder. better half. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to switch over the... Thank you. You know, you're, yeah, don't leave me. Oh. Where am I? Oh, I'm cool. So, hi. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, lots of the same, uh, you know, uh, expressions of appreciation for me as well to In Liquid and Claire and everyone who's helped put this together in Park Town Place as well for really kind of catering to the hilt. I love, you know, the way they put on a good show. Um, so, thank you all. Um, I'm going to start with kind of uh, just some general background information and then also um, I kind of took a very different tact on this presentation. I wanted to kind of go through my process a bit as an artist um, as it's kind of um, developed over the last, I guess we're going on 18 years since, um, since I finished grad school because in a lot of ways, although I've done a number of series probably around 18 or so in those years, um, it's almost like one massive series. Uh, the core concepts are rather similar, the expressions are then different. And so I kind of wanted to give a bit of that historical context um, before going into uh, the impetus for the, the work that's currently in this show. 
So anyways, um, you can see here, this is Taganic Falls. Uh, it's uh, located right outside of Ithaca, New York, which is where I grew up. Um, I was very fortunate to, to grow up more or less in the woods. My dad uh, was an architect and designed our house and put it in, in the woods. And so my childhood back in the you know, 70s and early 80s was you know, the age of neglectful parenting and lots of time just out there you know, running around, building forts and exploring and whatnot. And that definitely imprinted on me. Just like growing up in Ithaca imprinted on me. My, my little league baseball coach was in National Geographic for discovering a method for working with recombinant DNA in uh, dairy cattle uh, milk production. And like, it's just the, the whole environment is steeped in kind of the, the imprint of Cornell and the natural sciences. So um, that stuck with me. And, uh, you know, you can definitely see that, I think, in, in the work that I do. Um, I went to uh, undergrad school out in um, Boston at Massachusetts College of Art and Design. When I went there, I actually thought that I was going to be a sci-fi and fantasy book cover illustrator because, I don't know, sci-fi is really cool and fantasy is too and kind of <laughs> grew up on that and still like it to this day. And, uh, and it seemed safe because I could get a job with that, <laughs> I thought. And then I took a class in sculpture, in uh, figure modeling. And as soon as I laid my hands on clay and I got to work with the, that material and actually shape real three-dimensional objects that exist in our you know, shared space, I was hooked. And so I threw all caution to the wind and decided that I was going to be a fine art major and just see what happens. Um, I graduated in 1997. Um, I moved to Germany, which was a fantastic experience. I ended up living in Munich for just shy of five years. And um, one of the things that I liked most about that experience was one, being a foreigner. Um, and experiencing life from that perspective, learning a second language, and then also getting to, to tour around Western Europe and go to you know, extended vacations in France and Italy and Switzerland and Austria, and getting to experience all that magnificent architecture and the art, of course. Um, but I was also very anxious to come back to the United States and continue with my studies and hopefully an art career. Um, so that's what brought me to Philadelphia so that I could go to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts for my MFA. And um, while I was still doing my studies, I started adjuncting at places like Arcadia and the University of the Arts, and also in South Jersey at a couple of community colleges. And just so happened that a full-time position opened up at Camden County College, and I've been there ever since. So it's been a great career, and uh, I really love being in Philadelphia because it's got such a vital and vibrant arts community. So, um, yeah, when I finished grad school, um, I had been doing sculpture primarily up until that point, but I had always liked to draw and I always liked to draw out of my imagination, ergo the, the whole sci-fi fantasy thing. And, um, I decided that, uh, I wanted to really kind of invest myself in drawing more so. And so I started creating different form languages. I'm really interested in this idea of taking some core elements um, and combining them into a, a certain kind of design style or language that um, I can then, you know, once I figure out the, the formula for, I can then invent freely with and kind of improvise and allow the image to unfold in a very organic, natural way. Um, so I don't really know where it's going but I know the method by which I'm going to get there. And so um, for me, that really improved the quality of my work. Instead of illustrating an idea that I had in my head, I started to just allow this formula or algorithm, even you could call it, to unfold. And by being very present in the moment of saying, OK, well, what comes next? What comes next? What comes next? I was able to um, you know, create much more interesting and cohesive work. So this was part of an Organista series, and I'm going to go through a bunch of the series, not all of them, but kind of one example from each one, um, and just to give you a little bit of a taste. Uh, so this one was the Organista series, the first one, around 2004, 2005. Then came a geomorphic series that was very much uh, interested in geological formations, as well as kind of architectonic structures. 
I was really excited about rendering space and light and um, kind of taking the viewer on a mental journey through this, this fictive space, almost like, you know, honey, I shrunk the kids and now you're like this tiny little thing moving through this vast um, foreign yet also familiar landscape. Um, I've also been very interested in, well, a number of different sciences, primarily cognitive science, theoretical physics, biology, and aesthetics. Um, not science, I know, but still. Um, and this was a series uh, that I called the Energistic Series, um, because energetic sounds too much like a serial by Bruce Jenner or something like that. But um, <laughs> anyway, so Energistic Series, um, which was really kind of asking some of those questions about the, the formation of the universe, you know, origin of matter, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I was also kind of interested in the idea of the movement of the mind, how the mind is kind of stimulated and activated by this bombardment of visual information and how it kind of groups different clusters of, of uh, forms together as it moves through the composition, almost creating an image that feels like it's um, reacting to your, you know, your presence. Almost like, you know, the idea of the, the observer changing the observation um, right. Then there was, uh, the Arborescent series, definitely hearkening back to my love of, uh, the woods and, um, and this idea that, you know, when we go hiking, when we're out in nature, we're looking at all the things above ground, but there's this vast interconnected network, um, maybe even more of the ecosystem exists outside of the range of our, you know, awareness and our perception below the ground, um, in this case. Uh, another one inspired by theoretical physics and the, the whole question of like how many dimensions do you need to describe the physical universe and you know what about string theory and subatomic you know Planck length you know strings and this idea of one unit that through its repetition and maybe its behavior somehow starts to amalgamate and create uh, you know larger formations and structures that at some point you know start to give birth or give rise to things like, you know, cells and organisms and consciousness and ecosystems. And like, somehow there's got to be, you know, continuity in that continuum from that tiniest of tiny particles all the way up to these macro kind of events. And so uh, I actually tried to chart that out in nine steps. Um, here's step seven. Um, anyways, so there was that series. Uh, in 2007, I started playing around with ink and varnish because I was always fascinated by, you know, pouring cream and coffee or, you know, seeing an ink, you know, flow in water. But they're so, you know, uh, transitory and ephemeral, I, I wanted to find a way to kind of capture it. And the answer was um, an acrylic varnish. Anyway, so there I was with syringes and, you know, trying to steer and control these flows to create these organic patterns that really are kind of like the blueprint of, uh, of nature and, and growth patterns in nature. And once that solidified, I would go back with my 0 .001 brush and kind of start to, uh, you know, create some of those spheres, um, uh, kind of accentuate different textures and help to create a sense of, um, of light. Uh, that evolved into a series of ink and varnish pieces that were more kind of focused on a whole ecosystem. These are called the transmutation pieces, where this is kind of looking at the flow of energy throughout the, the ecosystem. Uh, just like Jenna is very, you know, influenced by people like Ernst Haeckel, and, and uh, uh, we found a video, a documentary called Pro, uh, The Protists, or Protist, was it? Um, I forget, you have it right now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Protist. <laughs> Yeah, protists. And uh, so I started a series called The Protists and really looking at this kind of idea of creating like uh, an encyclopedia of different fundamental structures and forms in nature, um, almost like a periodic table of elements, but of organic forms. And uh, then there were the seeds, which um, I got Jenna a book um, called The Microcosmos. And I um, took it back. And I took no, it that back. was from the seed book. Oh, that's from the seed book. I'm, wasn't that in there? 
Anyways, it's a different so, book. <laughs> suffice it to say, I gave her a book and I took it back. <laughs> and, After um, I drew some seeds. <laughs> and this is probably like the most illustrative series that I've done um, because, again, I do work 99% uh, purely out of my imagination. Um, this, I was actually looking at some seeds, trying to expand the repertoire of different forms that I, I might utilize in future works. This is a, a, a short little series that I did based on my hikes in the Wissahickon. Uh, one of the great things about living out in Mount Airy is that the Wissahickon is right there. And they've got just beautiful trails. Um, and so, you know, I want to capture that feeling of the fascination, the wonder, the awe um, that, that I experience when I'm out hiking and just kind of connecting with, with my environment, with the natural environment. It's a series that kind of took some of the elements of the energistic series, but worked it in with some more organic pieces. It's called a constructivist series. And then uh, here's an example of some rotifers. Also, you know, very tiny little organisms that live in both freshwater and, and saltwater. And um, also I was playing around with different uh, kind of structures and uh, anatomy that implies various functions and the like. Um, and that's kind of the, the background. Um, to get to the actual kind of inspiration and, you know, of the current work that's in the show, or, well, it's not totally current anymore, but it, it, up until 2021 it was, um, I, uh, I was fortunate uh, to be invited to do this residency at the Mountain Lake Biological Station in, outside of Blacksburg, Virginia. It's connected with the University of Virginia, and the artist residency portion is where they invite a handful of professors from UVA and VCU, um, and then somehow I got into the mix, which was great. Uh, and um, they bring us out to their campus, which is nice and remote, um, and uh, surrounded by you know pretty about as as kind of pristine wilderness as I've experienced growing up on the, the East Coast and then living in Germany. It doesn't have a lot of that nature left. Um, and uh, the whole idea behind the program was to get artists and scientists talking with one another. Um, when you're out there, um, again, it is, there's a lake. <laughs> That's the name. Um, it's very beautiful. We uh, were given various residencies, and so this was my cabin for two weeks. It was so gorgeous, so cute. It's a little one-person cabin. And um, you were one behind. I was? Yeah. Oh, rats. You were looking at that. You gotta look at Thanks. that. Thanks. Sorry. Okay. That's why I keep her around. Um, <laughs> and it had a nice little fireplace, which, especially <laughs> since even in the middle of summer, it can be like 65 degrees and uh, rainy, which was really nice because then when I called Jenna, it was 105 <laughs> and swampy here. And I was like, I feel good. <laughs> but anyways, uh, part of this exchange was, again, talking with the, the resident scientists up there. There are a number of uh, ongoing research projects, primarily in ecology and herpetology. Um, and here, uh, kind of folks in the, in the middle with the beard, was Henry. He was my great resource. I got to talk to him every lunch and breakfast uh, and, and, you know, yap his ear off, uh, asking him questions about various things that I discovered while hiking. Um, and they also have uh, summer classes for students, and so there's a very vibrant science, you know, community out there um, with a couple of artists sprinkled through. I got to go in the Beetle Crew car, uh, or ATV, which is very cool. One of the main ongoing research projects that they have there. Um, but most of the time, I spent by myself. Um, I went out hiking every day, two to three hours at a stint. And I just explored. There were some beautiful vistas uh, over the uh, Jefferson National Forest, and uh, part of the Appalachian Trail cuts through there. Um, but you know, this is this is where I feel at home. This is my kind of my happy place for sure. And uh, just like Jenna was talking about, I had that magpie magpie sensibility of you know having to pick up all the the cool things that you find out there. And so you know, I'd photograph various lichen, various brackets, and, uh, and fungi, and, and mosses, and the like. I didn't know I could eat that at the time. Had I known, I would have gotten those chicken of the woods, you know, and fried them up, but I didn't know. Henry told me after I got back. Um, and I started, you know, I, this was the, the, the first and only artist residency that I've done. I have two small children. They kind of get in the way sometimes. 
But, um, you know, I, uh, I was like, what do, what do I do out here? Like, how do I prove my worth? Like, I, I got to come up with something. And, you know, it kind of occurred to me, well, like, do what you always do. <laughs> um, you don't have to change who you are all of a sudden. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to just start collecting samples of various things. And, you know, uh, out there, lichen grow like they do not grow around here. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen lichen, you know, on a boulder, on the side of a tree, something like that. But they really do thrive in much more clean environments and uh, with much less air pollution. So there were species that I'd never seen before and definitely kind of a scale and a scope that I was not familiar with. Um, a lot of times lichen go kind of, they fly under the radar. They actually cover roughly 5% of all land masses, you know, around the, the globe. Um, but they're really fascinating when you start getting up close and you start looking at the, all the fine little details. So there I was collecting mushrooms, collecting lichen, and then photographing them uh, with my, my camera, my little phone camera, nothing special, um, against the black soapstone lab tables in, uh, in one of the, the labs. And um, you know, I like zooming in, I like isolating and, and kind of abstracting through isolation um, and decontextualizing it so that you really kind of put into a unique experience relative to the object. Um, and this is what started the series. I started taking some of these little guys back into my, my cabin and I started drawing them, you know, in the afternoon, at night, you know, in between hikes and the like. And so, sorry for the blurry photos, uh, uh, yeah. Um, but something like this turned into something like that. This is called Spanish moss, but it's actually lichen, and it became that. And um, so, you know, over the course of those two weeks, every day, out hiking I go, every day, you know, back in the cabin drawing and, uh, and then also they had some other programming, which is great. I get to listen to some, uh, you know, doctoral dissertations and stuff like that. Um, so if you want to know about like bat populations in the Northeast, I got some info. Um, anyways, so this is really where the series um, originated. And then I continued to work on it once I got back to Philly. And um, in each of these drawings, and I'm going to have to go relatively quickly because I didn't listen to Jenna, and I put 83 slides on here. But anyways. Um, I told him. <laughs> uh, you know, each one takes an element or a couple of elements from actual lichen species that, you know, either I collected and photographed or I researched and found. And then I take that and I use that as the, the formation, the, the foundation for a form language that, again, I just start to improvise on to populate and create the whole composition. In each of these, I am, um, you know, putting it against a black background uh, and isolating it within, you know, the center of a square with that white border, all to kind of create this sense of really kind of focusing the attention and the mind in on this specific thing, almost trying to create like a meditative relationship uh, between the viewer and the object. And um, to uh, also kind of look at, you know, what if I take one of these elements, like um, these, little, these little puckered, almost like blood cell-like uh, shapes are uh, called ascocorps, and they're, they're actually the, the fruiting reproductive body of the lichen. Um, and, you know, what if I make the whole thing out of those? What if I, you know, take those and I put them on the ends of some of the stalks that I saw in these tubulose, uh, you know, species of, of lichen? Uh, again, just trying to go through different um, iterations and combinations. Uh, some of these are small, uh, well, small by, by my standard, which is uh, usually I like to work really large um, or larger. Uh, these are four foot squares. Um, or sorry, 36 inch squares, and uh, a bunch of the other ones are 15 inch squares. But um, I, I want to thank a uh, professor that I had as an undergrad student. His name was Jose Buscalia. He's a, a Puerto Rican sculptor who was doing um, research and uh, work at Harvard and also adjuncting at MassArt when I was there. 
and he taught my 3D design and figure modeling classes. And he had us do an assignment where we had to brainstorm 20 different designs using horizontal and vertical lines only in 20 minutes. I torture my 2D design students to this day with this assignment <laughs> because I love the idea of what happens when you kind of put yourself under this, this stress and the strain of coming up with more solutions, more solutions, more solutions. Um, where, how do you invent? How do you create? Uh, how does it evolve over time? And so um, this is kind of feeding into this series where I just kept on recombining, taking different elements and seeing what, what happens, what, what evolves and, and comes out of it. Um, yeah, uh, they did start to change a little bit. I started to uh, you know, bring in a little bit of fungus language, bring in some slime molds, because you know slime molds are really cool too. Um, and uh, this series, again, capped out somewhere around 59 pieces. Apparently, I've got 13 more to go, so just hang with me. Um, but uh, the, the whole goal for me in, uh, in these is to really try to embody uh, a handful of what I consider very important values that, are, that inform my life, a connection with nature, a fascination and an inquisitiveness, um, a sense of awe, and a sense of mystery. And just this kind of, if there's something to be taken away, like a moral of the story, it's to, to pay attention, to experience, and to, to revel a bit. And... <laughs> no, I can, I'll actually go back, it, just because... These last five um, are four of which are actually displayed here in the various uh, buildings. This first one is not, but um, I took uh, one of the the species, or, or it's probably actually a a, um, a genus of of lichen. They're called um, uh, fruticose lichen, and they kind of have leafy parts. <laughs> and um, and so I you know took this one and I decided let me see if I can kind of. Uh, you know, take it through a, a, an evolution, a shift where the veining becomes more and more prominent and the leaves fall away and you basically transmute from one form into something that's very different at the end. Um, it's kind of a fun mental exercise. And so we have, again, four of the five, you know, the last one ending in this very kind of dendritic um, root-like structure. And that's that. So, same thing. Oh, thanks. If you want to check out Instagram, <laughs> this is this is my replacement for my god awful website. Um, I, you know, it gets a lot more traction, a lot more viewing, and uh, it is a way to kind of see what's happening currently. You know, and whenever something's done, I post it there, and then also email in case you want to buy something or just contact. But thank you very much. Have any questions? When you were playing with the plexiglass, were you at all influenced by the idea of like a microscope slide? Yes, I love that because the way it's backlit um, on the on the stage. Um, yeah, and that was always, you know, like I think I drew my first like cell under a microscope, like a potato cell in fifth grade or something, and I was like, oh yeah, this is something I could get into. And then I never got past um, intro bio, you know, just basic college stuff uh, because I was an art major so they don't encourage you to take a lot of bio but same thing with the microscope yeah I love <laughs> it was yeah I considered them like I call them slides because I look at them as like big microscopic slides nice catch <laughs> <laughs> so you clearly are so interested in this like biology art hybrid is this the first body of work where that those things kind of join together to have you flirted with this before? It's been going on since undergrad. Um, in undergrad, I was playing a lot with benzene ring models and the, the hexagon and um, making, I was looking a lot at like the golden section and grids and stuff and then building grids out of hexagons. Um, and then I just kind of went from cells and to histopathology. And even now I still like in my, my sketchbook is filled with little 
plants and like seed pods and lichen bits and stuff like that. So I guess all these bio. Dick, you had a question? I have a question. For me or for is, Greg? What, for both of you. Your work has a lot of uh, complementary aspects and similarities. And I was just wondering, how did you two meet? <laughs> that is a self-serving question right there. Some wacky guy that I used to work for, I dragged him to this art opening because I was socially anxious and I didn't want to be alone and I wanted to support this guy that had done a bunch of framing for me and this guy that had done framing was showing with this other guy that was best friends with this other guy and then at the end of the opening, Dick said, let's all go out to dinner because that's his extroverts. So I'd like, they confound me, but, but like, that's his way. He's just like, why well, you know, we're having a good time. Let's go out to dinner. And Greg and I were, we're both yeah. married, but we became friends and then marriage is dissolved over time. And here we are. And it's all, thank that guy right over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's all his fault. But I'm happy to have yeah, so any, were any of you at the opening reception? You two were, right? Remember when he said dirty francs? Yes. The man behind you was like buying the round. <laughs> <laughs> the other question I had to jump off of that is like, so you two had your own artistic practice, like how far along were you both as artists when you met and then like when you moved? <laughs> We, we met in 2010 at said opening, um, and, uh, you know, I graduated from PAFA in 2004. You know, Jenna, you finished up at Cookstown in the late 90s? Yeah, I mean, when we met, I think at the time I was getting a Master's of Science for my, my day job to support the art thing. Um, so yeah. the, the, the short answer is Barry. Um, yeah, we were doing know, stuff for it sure. Was, it was just, it was uncanny how much overlap uh, we discovered when we met and we started talking. And, you know, it's like, oh, you love graphite too. And, yeah, oh, you collect all <laughs> sorts of, you know, little doodads in the forest too. And, oh, you've like been watching this and reading that. And, you know, um, I have referred to her as my artistic soulmate before. Like, uh, it, it definitely was um, just a, it, it was a great discovery that we met each other and, and are able to share all of these common interests. Yeah, nobody else ever gave me seed pods as a present. <laughs> it's a very cheap way to take care of Christmas <laughs> and the holidays. You're like, look what I found. You get her a book and some crap you found in the yard, she said. <laughs> So one of the things that I loved about the show was seeing how on one end of the spectrum we have couples like you who, who their work really was so similar in certain ways, in a lot of ways for you guys, uh, and then other couples who like their work wouldn't be further apart. Um, and I do think that the, the work that you guys sent me to, like to pull from, uh, just happened to be like very similar. Um, but now you said that body of work is done, like you're mm -hmm. finished that series. And so what are you working on now? And does it still match up with what Jenna's working on? No. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> um, so I'm back into the, uh, the theoretical physics, subatomics, um, you know, matrix of energy uh, kind of works. Um, I'm currently, so I, I started doing a handful of these about, uh, well, I guess in, in September of last year. And uh, I did maybe 15, you know, small to medium size. And now I'm on to a four foot by six foot piece, which is insanely detailed. I'm about 170 hours of labor into it. And I've got about 130 to go. And so I've got a nice callus to, to show for it. And this is what I do every night. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, it's uh, all a, a matrix of polygons that actually conform to an undulating, almost like a, you know, a, a bubble multiverse kind of composition. And um, yeah, I'm really kind of playing around with the diffusion of the form into that, that network or matrix. Um, so definitely more of the, the physics driven side of what I do currently. 
And then are you still working with the misbegotten sea creatures? Uh, no, I'm back into medical imagery. So I lost two family members in the past five years. And so I started digging into basically like their history through the lens of biology and histopathology. And then also because uh, both these women, like everything craft came naturally to them. Like if you give me a pile of craft supplies, I'll make you a pile of garbage. I'm so bad at it, but they're both wonderful at it, especially with textiles. And so I am recreating medical images on linen with paint and then embroidering the paintings. And I'm also, I made some ink out of the ashes of my mother's medical records and some ink from ashes from um, cremation. And I think I'll be playing with that on linen next. So. Yeah, I guess sea creatures were very jolly and happy for me, and now I'm <laughs> doing some stuff that's a little less jolly, but keeps me feeling jolly in my day to day. So yeah, we are, I guess we're, we diverged a bit. Um, still using graphite though, both of us. Yeah. <laughs> still, still very detailed, still very organic. Um, yeah. Still very biological. So, I mean, with art, from what I know, you never stop learning and growing and playing and all that stuff. Well, hopefully think, with everything, right? What? Hopefully with everything, yeah, not just art. With everything. Uh, have you found that being so similar that, you know, when you start playing with one thing, like you found the graphite and you hasn't found your, its way over that you play with it too and you like, It's way too out. messy. <laughs> way too messy. But yeah, but as like techniques and stuff go, have you really built off each other, kind of done your own things and found that, oh yeah, I like this too? I think he's made me a better artist, actually. Oh, um, thanks. But I've, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I've also realized like, kind of like where I thrive is mixing media in some ways. Like I don't think Greg would take a sheet of polypropylene and just like start pouring water on graphite. It gives me the wheelies. I yeah. mean, so she's like, yeah, so I took the paper and I put it in the bathtub. I'm like, no, how dare you? Like, you know, heart palpitations over here. Yeah, definitely Yeah, I, maybe it made us like even stay in our lanes a little more rigidly in some ways because um, I like I went back to rabbit skin glue that I hadn't been using for, you know, since a few years before I met him and now I'm back to loving that stuff and putting it on surfaces i mean i think it's impossible not to have influ you know influence each other along the way and part of it is you know things like the blue planet i was there for every blue planet episode you know i've i've watched it just as I many watched times at home <laughs> that's do i you know but anyway so you know there's definitely like we, we enjoy a lot of the same things and so it naturally starts to you know influence the work in similar ways but um, we don't actually visit each other's studios much. <laughs> Just like we have separate houses and really like having our own living spaces, we also have our separate studios. And, you know, sometimes I'll go over and, and you know, be invited in. Um, sometimes she'll make her way up to the third floor to my studio when she's over. But it's pretty rare. Um, it really is kind of like we like each other's things on Instagram. <laughs> and, yeah, when and, did you start that? <laughs> yeah, and we and we uh, you know we've been in a handful of shows together because we seem to pair well. <laughs> um, but uh, you know the 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 way that the work kind of converges, I think, happens really kind of naturally from just shared interests. And that's like, oh, you're doing that? I am too. <laughs> yeah, that cool. that seed book that he gave me for Christmas one year, and then borrowed. So I've drawn yeah. some seeds from it and then he took it off my hands and he hadn't seen my seed ones. drawings and then he started drawing seeds and we had like four matches that we both picked out of the same book unwittingly <laughs> yeah. like we were not consulting with each other and so greg you said um when you were in school and maybe mm -hmm. for a while afterwards uh you were doing a fair amount of 3d work mm -hmm. is that anywhere in your practice anymore jenna it sounds like you're doing some more 3D stuff with the textiles? Yeah. I mean, I guess if embroidering is 3D, I'm okay. all about layers of flatness. That, okay. uh, that's like his <laughs> world is that, that he likes me world? to live in. <laughs> um, 
Well, I teach it, uh, <laughs> but uh, in terms of active practice, I think the last sculpture I made was probably about four or five years ago. Okay. Um, there was some stone laying around in the, the studio at the college, and I was like, yeah, I used to do a lot of wood carving. Let's try some stone carving. And I got hooked on that for a little bit, and I did a series of uh, limestone and marble carvings. Um, I did a lot of ceramics as an undergrad, and I, I still... Every now and then we'll dive back in and do some ceramic sculpture as well as functional pottery, which is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, but I, in terms of the main kind of focus of my artistic practice and, and vision, if we want to call it that, uh, I worked myself into a place at the end of grad school where I had built a, uh, an eight, 18 foot by nine foot room within the larger gallery and it had a light kill and a black carpet and black walls. And I had two four foot diameter hemispheres of uh, wax sculptures where I had basically grown um, wax forms in a baby pool where I'd pour molten wax into the water and just kind of like control it to grow these formations. And then I cold chased all the wax together and I coated it with a, um, a resin kind of jacket uh, and some fiberglass in the back to reinforce it. And so these were these two hemispheres that were wall mounted and you walked into this, you know, pitch black space where there are just tight spotlights on those two pieces. And it's this kind of, you know, you're in the abyss and you're seeing the, you know, the, 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 the entelechy of, a, of the internal, you know, constituents of a star or a planet or something like that. Kind of the guts spewed out. Anyways, long story short. That's a lot of work, a lot of, a lot of money, <laughs> and especially raising two children and the like, uh, the, the logistics of yeah. that kind of sculpture on that scale, the expense. I was like, you know what? This is just not, until somebody's giving me money for it, I'm going to do something that's much more manageable and, and also allows me to evolve more rapidly. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really when I made the, the shift to the drawings and I really haven't looked back because the drawings are giving me 99% of everything that I want. Um, there is that 1% where I'm like, Hey, if, if, uh, the public sculpture, you know, grants coming through where I could, you know, pour say 10 grand into something, I've got ideas, <laughs> but I'm not actively <laughs> pursuing sculpture uh, as part of the regular practice. Still love it though. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> really much to talk. Thank you. Come on, go get some food, guys. Yeah. Hello. I'm Claire Finan, the program coordinator at Parktown Place and the programming director at Inliquid. On behalf of Parktown Place and in Liquid, we'd like to humbly acknowledge the Lenape peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. Thank you all for joining us for this artist talk with Greg Brellix and Jenna Hannum. This talk is brought to you by in Liquid and Parktown Place Museum District Residences, a premier Air Communities property. Situated in the heart of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, Parktown Place has dedicated themselves to making the arts an amenity. In addition to being surrounded by neighboring arts institutions, Parktown Place has brought the arts inside their buildings through their rich permanent collection, regular art workshops, classes, events, artist talks, and three separate gallery spaces for rotational temporary exhibitions. The current temporary ex exhibition is twofold, which highlights the work of five artist couples in long-term relationships with one another, all of whom have their own established independent careers. Through this show, we see how the artists influence, challenge, and inspire each other while still maintaining their unique artistic practice.